Refer to the list of substances below. Okay, so we've got hydrochloric acid. Okay, let's just go. Select the true statement from the list below. Okay, so they're talking about nonpolar, iron dipole, uh, room temperature, blah, 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 blah. So I think, let's go practice drawing the Lewis diagram of all of these. And then we'll just classify each one as polar or nonpolar. And then we come on to the questions. Okay, so it's going to be like a nice practice for you just to learn Lewis diagrams or to practice your Lewis diagrams um, and to understand polar, nonpolar, net dipole moments, things like that. So let's start with HCl. So remember to do a Lewis diagram, um, just look at the H and look at the CL and let's go see how many valence electrons. So to find valence electrons, you just look at the group number. So hydrogen is in group one, so we can say it's got one valence electron. Chlorine is in group seven. Um, one, two, whoops, wrong row, bro. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So chlorine has seven valence electrons. If you add those together, we've got a total of eight valence electrons. Okay, so go write them down. Now, the next step is to put one bonding pair between the two atoms. Okay, so there we've put two electrons. So how many do we still have? Well, eight minus two is six. So we still have six more electrons. And so we're gonna go put all six of them over here. Why only around the chlorine? Well, because hydrogen is a bit of a weird atom. Hydrogen only ever wants to have two electrons around it. So there it's got two, but most other atoms re require eight. And that is what we call the octet rule. Okay, so if you look at the electronegativity now of chlorine, we can see that the electronegativity of chlorine is three. If you look at hydrogen's electronegativity, it is 2.1. So chlorine is more electronegative. That means chlorine loves electrons more than hydrogen does. So the electrons are going to be closer to chlorine. So the electrons moved towards, I'm just going to show it over here, the electrons moved, or let me try to draw it there, towards um, chlorine, okay? So if you look at this entire molecule, this part is gonna become, or, or, or what I like to tell learners is look at this arrow. There's only one arrow going like that. So this molecule, there's no other arrow going this way, for example. So there's nothing that's going to cancel that arrow out. So this molecule um, is going to have a net dipole moment. If it didn't have a net dipole, if, if there was another force going this way, then these two arrows would cancel out, and then we would say that it does not have a net dipole moment. So because it does have a net dipole moment, we are going to call this a polar molecule. So HCl is a polar molecule. Let's move on to Cl2. So I'm going to go a little bit faster with Cl2. So with Cl2, you're just going to have two Cls. Now each Cl is in group seven, so there's going to be a total of um, 14 valence electrons. So you always put two of them in the middle. Then you put the remaining 12 on the outside atoms, except for hydrogen, if there was hydrogen. Okay, and there we're done. So now because these two atoms are exactly the same, the electrons are not going to go more that way or more that way. So there is no arrow. And so this is a, this molecule has no net dipole moment. And so this is a non-polar molecule. So this is a non-polar molecule. For water, that's H2O. So if you look at H2O. So if you look at each hydrogen, well, each one is going to have a valence C of one. So there's, uh, so this hydrogen has a valency of one. This hydrogen has a valency of one, and then oxygen has a valency of. So you look at the group numbers. This is group one, group two, group three, group four, group five, group six. So oxygen has a valency of six. If you add that up, there is a total of eight. Now a lot of learners draw the water molecule like this. It's not. It, it's not a problem, but you need to, there's a certain part where you, um, when we go do the the Lewis, uh, the electrons now, and then there's a certain part that should remind you to make it look a little bit different. Okay, but I'll show you what that is now. So there's eight valence electrons. Now we should always go put two valence electrons between the atoms, and then all of the remaining electrons. So we've used four, so we have four left over. You would usually go put those on the outside atoms. However, with hydrogen, it only ever wants to have 
two. So it's already got two and it's already got two over there. So you're gonna put the remaining electrons there. Now, these electrons here are called lone pairs. And lone pairs change the shape. They change the shape. At this point in your exam, I would hope that you would then remember that the way to draw a water molecule is not like that, but rather like that. So this is where your teacher would give it the name angular or bent. Now it's important that we do that because if you did it like this, then when you go look at the, 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 the dipole moment, if you look at oxygen, it has an electronegativity of 3.5, but hydrogen is 2.1. So the electrons are going towards hydrogen. So you would show an arrow like that, and you would show an arrow like that. But if you left it like that, you would say, oh, look, the arrows are gonna ban uh, bansel. The arrows are gonna cancel each other out. And then you might be tempted to say that this is a nonpolar molecule, but this is not correct. This is the way we draw it because of the lone pair electrons, it changes the shape. So the electrons do go towards oxygen, but look now, look at those arrows. Do they cancel out? No, they don't. So they are gonna create a net dipole moment. Now, if something goes to the right and up, then what is the overall effect? Well, the overall effect is that it would go like that. So it has got a net dipole moment. So water is a polar molecule. Anything that has a net dipole moment is polar. So this is water is polar. The next one is NH3, ammonia. So if you look at N, uh, nitrogen, one, two, three, four, five, it's in group five, so it's got five valence electrons. And then if you look at the hydrogens, there's three of them, and each one has one valence electron. So if you add that up, there are eight valence electrons in total. Now the rules for drawing an elect for drawing Lewis diagrams is that you should always put the um, always put the least electronegative atom in the middle. But remember, there is an exception to the rule. The exception to the rule is hydrogen. Hydrogen always goes on the outside. Whether it's the highest electronegativity, lowest electronegativity, it doesn't matter. Hydrogen always goes on the outside. So what I'll do is I'll put nitrogen and then I'm gonna put hydrogen on the outside like that. Okay, now we go take, a, we put a bonding pair of electrons between each of them like that. So how many electrons have we used? We've used six. So if you say eight minus six, you can take out your calculator. That's a joke, guys. Come on, eight minus six, we can do this. It's two. <laughs> so um, eight minus six is two, and so that means we've got two electrons left over. Now, normally you would put those two electrons on the outside atoms, but not with hydrogen, because once again, hydrogen only likes to have two electrons. So you can only put those remaining two electrons over there. Now, if you look at, and by the way, you might say, Kevin, there's a lone pair of electrons. Yes, you are correct, my fine warrior. Well done. So <laughs> there is um, a lone pair, and we said that the lone pair changes the shape. So if you're curious, the, the way that this shape changes is it bends a little bit. It, it goes more like um, there and there. So it's like, it, 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 let me go back to the beginning. These electrons, these lone pairs, they push these electrons away. They push them further away. And so that it ends up going like there and there, for example, okay? Now, if we look at the shape, so uh, not the shape, the, the, the net dipole moment. So we know that nitrogen has an electronegativity of three. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1. So the electrons love nitrogen or nitrogen loves electrons. So the electrons are gonna go towards nitrogen like that. So if we draw those arrows, would they cancel each other out? Nope. This is definitely gonna cause a net dipole moment, which would go something like that, okay? If you struggle to work out the net dipole moment, um, for those of you that love head-to-tail diagrams and stuff like that, you could choose to draw one of the arrows, then draw another one, so I'm gonna draw that one, and then draw the next one. And so to work out the overall effect, you always just go from the beginning 
to the end. And so that's the effect that's happening over there. Okay, but that's getting super technical. So the idea is, is, is there a net dipole moment? Yes, there is a net dipole moment. What that means, it's almost like in physics where, is there a net force? Yes, there is a net force. It doesn't cancel out. And so this is a polar molecule. So this is polar. The idea is, is that eventually you become really good at understanding these different molecules that you can draw them really quickly for yourself in the exam. Okay, let's move on to nitrogen. Now nitrogen's an easy one, it's just two nitrogens. Now without even drawing all the electrons, ah, let's just do it, it's good practice, ain't it? Okay, Kevin, you're not Australian, mate. Okay, ain't it? <laughs> okay, so um, let's quickly, so if we look at nitrogen, there are, um, it's in group five. So each nitrogen has five electrons, five and five. So if you say five plus five, that is 10 electrons. So we are supposed to go and put a bonding pair like that. And then we're just gonna go move all the remaining electrons um, on the outside. But uh-oh, we've already used 10. So we only have 10. If you went and put more, that would be incorrect because we only have 10. So all that we do now is we just move these two, for example, towards the middle. There we go. And then we can move these two into the middle. And what's nice about doing that is that this nitrogen here still has eight, so it doesn't feel like it's been robbed. And this nitrogen still has eight, so it's happy now. And so both of them have eight. Now, that's where nitrogen gets its triple bond from. Okay, now obviously, then the electronegativities are the same. Both of them are three. So the electrons are not gonna go more this way or more this way. So there's no, we'll say that there is no net dipole moment. That's like in physics saying that there's no net force. So this is a non-polar molecule. Okay, so I'm gonna say um, NP because I'm pretty cool. Like, think how cool that is. Like, I don't say non-polar, I just say NP. What up, bruh? Okay, so let's just write here, non-polar. I just had it in the wrong color. Non-polar. Okay, now HF, last one. And I know I'm taking longer than um, we would need, but you know, I use these lessons as a teaching and an exam practice lesson. So um, let's do the last one, HF. Okay, so with hydrogen, um, it's in group one. So it's got one lone electron, I mean one um, valence electron. Um, F, fluorine is in group one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So um, we'll Kev, F, it's seven. So there's a total of eight electrons. Put them next to each other, put a bonding pair between them. How many electrons are left? Well, six. So now you're gonna put the six around fluorine because hydrogen does not want any more than two electrons. So there's the Lewis diagram of hydrogen fluoride or HF. So if you look at the electronegativity of fluorine, it's four. If you look at the electronegativity of hydrogen, it's 2.1. So the electrons are like so in love with fluorine. So the electrons go towards fluorine. And so that's the only arrow that we have on our diagram. So there is nothing that will cancel that arrow out. So there will be a net dipole moment because that is the only arrow. There's nothing that would cancel that. So overall, this is a polar molecule because when there's a net dipole moment, then it's a polar molecule. Okay, so we now have a very good idea of what's polar, what's non-polar. So now let's see how this goes. Okay, so NH3 is a non-polar molecule. That's not true because we worked out that it's a polar molecule. Um, Iron dipole forces exist between molecules of HF. No, if you have molecules of HF and another HF, uh, we've now worked out that this is a polar and this is a polar. If you put two polars next to each other, they are gonna have dipole-dipole forces. Or if they are certain types, then it could also be hydrogen bonding. But it definitely is not gonna be iron. There's no ions here. Iron is when you have like a charge, like a little positive or a little negative. Ain't none of that here. Okay, let's see this one. The melting point of NH3 will be higher than for Cl2. Okay, so let's go have a look at that one. So NH3, N... Now when you melt NH3, you need to understand, when you melt NH3, guys, you are not breaking these bonds over here. That is not what happens when you melt something. When you melt something, you are separating the intermolecular forces, which are the forces between two molecules. That's what happens when you melt. 
So that's where you've got London forces, dipole, dipole, all of that. Now, here we have a polar molecule. Remember, we worked it out as polar. So we have two polar molecules. Now, when you have two polar molecules next to each other, the intermolecular force is going to be either dipole, dipole, or if it is nitrogen, high, whoa, Kev, nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine connected with a hydrogen. So any one of those connected with a hydrogen, then you get hydrogen bonding. So here we have nitrogen and hydrogen connected. So this is going to be hydrogen bonding. So in between here, you are going to have hydrogen bonding, which is very strong, very strong. Well, not as strong as things like ionic bonding, metallic bonding, covalent bonding, but that's something else. But for the intermolecular forces, hydrogen bonding is pretty strong. Now, if we go look at Cl2, Cl2 is just going to look like this. Okay, now you, to be able to mold something, you have to look at another molecule. Remember, we always need two molecules. Okay, so when you mold it, you are going to be overcoming or separating it, these molecules from each other, uh, this one and this one. So you're going to be separating them, okay? So this is a nonpolar. This is a nonpolar. When you have two nonpolars next to each other, then you get London forces. Now, London forces are not very strong. So I want you to think about this carefully. Let's say that you and I, we are on a mission. And what is our mission? Our mission is to try and melt these, or we have to try and melt these. Now, what happens when you melt something? Well, when you melt something, you go from a solid, which is where the molecules are really close together. So that's a solid and you go to a liquid where they are further apart. So you need to be able to pull the molecules apart. You need to be able to overcome that force of attraction. Is it going to be easier for you and I to separate these two from each other? Or is it gonna be easier to separate these two from each other? Well, think about it. This hydrogen bond is really strong. These London forces are really weak. So I don't know about you, but I think it's gonna be easy to separate these two very easy. That means that the melting point is going to be lower for this molecule. Melting point will be lower. Because remember, the melting point is a temperature, and temperature is energy. So if you don't need that much energy to be able to separate them, then the temperature doesn't have to be that high. But with these ones, you are going to need a much larger temperature because temperature is energy and you need more energy to pull these molecules apart. So this would have a high melting point because it's difficult to separate the molecules because they are holding on to each other with hydrogen bonding. So you would need to raise the temperature to have enough energy to separate them. Did you know that, guys, that the, in the temperature is just the form of energy? So the higher the temperature, the more energy you have. So here you could have a low melt. This one would have a low melting point. This one would have a high melting point. So quest C says the melting point of NH3 will be higher than Cl2. Absolutely yes. That is the answer.